Hello and welcome to Impactability, the Nonprofit Leaders Podcast. This is a show that explores the landscape of the nonprofit organization, big and small, offers some incredibly helpful information and resources, and gives nonprofits a place to share ideas and get advice. I'm your host, Joe Turner. Our show is sponsored by Sukup Strategic Solutions, offering a wide variety of services to help nonprofits maximize their impact. So let's get into solving the problems that might be plaguing your nonprofit. Hey, thanks for joining us today on a special edition of Impactability. Today is marking our 50th episode, Big 5-0, and we are so excited for that, and we thank you for supporting us throughout all these 50 episodes. I have to say that we've covered so much ground in the nonprofit spectrum, so many different topics. We've talked about grant writing, case statements, cultivation, plan gifts, stewardship, technology, publicity, everything you could possibly think of, and there's so many more topics yet to discuss. What we've decided to do today is kind of look back at our first 49 episodes on this number 50 and kind of do some highlights of some of the episodes we've had and talk about some of the things that you are most concerned about. And one of our most important topics, obviously, with a nonprofit podcast is fundraising and especially major gifts. Now, obviously, major gifts do not come from the clear blue sky takes a lot of effort and hard work, and can represent the majority of your fundraising. But if you're not doing it right, you could have a long haul. We had one of the absolute best experts back on episode 16, Dr. Lou Trena, on some of the common mistakes that development officers make when it comes to donor development for major gifts. Well, if you have a, if you have an individual that is really good at corporate sponsorships and they use the same approach with families that are philanthropic, that's a mistake. If you have a board that is primarily good at bringing corporate gifts in and annual gifts in, uh, and then you ask them to bring potential philanthropic families in and individuals, that could be a mistake. You want to build your, your operation around the fundraising science of the vehicles you're driving. And so major gifts will require making sure you have the right people to drive the science of fundraising major gifts. Obviously, there are a lot of pieces to the puzzle when it comes to fundraising, but one of the most important pieces that we've discussed on this podcast is stewardship. Once you've got the gift, how do you thank the donor? Stewardship is so very important. And on episode 14, our guest Mark Litzler told us what world-class stewardship is all about. What I found in virtually every place that I've worked is that 90% of our larger donors are already giving. So it's about renewing their support annually. And that boils down to what's the basis of the relationship? What are they looking for? What do they need from the organization or around their gift? And you look at corporations, foundations, and individuals all differently when it comes to stewardship. Because corporations, they're looking for very specific outcomes from their sponsorship or, 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 or their gift. Foundations... They have specific interests around the outcomes of their grant. And stewardship with the foundation is all about providing the outcomes and the reporting that you all agreed to when you accepted the grant. And for individuals, like I've said earlier, it's it's all about understanding what their specific interest is and then providing enough reporting and thanking and engagement and all other stewardship to keep them happy with the organization and, and understanding that the organization really loves them and, and relies on them as an important investor. On episode 34, we talked to Tim Kachuriak, who has done exhaustive research about donors and why they give, how they give, etc. And we asked him, what are nonprofits not doing when it comes to fundraising? So one of the things that uh, is really, really important, and a lot of people kind of like, I don't know if they overlook it, but they may not give it the attention that it deserves is email fundraising. So email, if you look across, and we've looked across thousands of different nonprofit organizations at the data, if you look at where their digital revenue comes from, the majority of that revenue is coming from email fundraising. So then one of the things that nonprofits are not doing is that they're not actively trying to build their email file. And if they are, they're doing things like simply sign up for our newsletter. Well, I got, I got to tell you, Joe. Every single nonprofit organization has a newsletter. There's nothing compelling about the value proposition of signing up to hear you talk about yourself. 
We're going back into the archives and listening to some bits and pieces of some of our older episodes, some highlights from some of our older episodes. And when it comes to fundraising, one of our absolute best episodes was number 40. We talked to Tim Sarantonio from Neon One about the who, what, when, why, and how of donors. How people give generally comes down to cutting down on the friction. So for many, for instance, online donations, how many clicks does it take to get even to your donation page? So the more friction you place, the higher likelihood somebody's going to bounce off. And that still goes for direct mail, right? Like, is it easy for me to understand the remittance envelope? People don't understand the elegance of direct mail. And every piece has a role to play, and especially with QR codes. Yeah. But that's how we need to, to step back and go, our preferred processing capabilities are not how they want to do things. Yeah, yeah. So if you're going to remember one primary thing on how people give, it's that they're going to give how they prefer to give. Mm -hmm. So invest in the experience of giving itself across mm -hmm. the board. Such a great point. We've talked about fundraising, obviously an important topic, but what about technology, the technology that drives fundraising? Now, some nonprofits have all of their tech in order, and some folks are a bit tech shy, if you will. Back on episode 19, we talked to Abby Jarvis from QGive, and we were talking about the technology of fundraising and how some people are a little tech shy. So many people, especially in smaller nonprofits, tend to be tech shy. Why do you think that is? You know, I think there are a few big reasons, but I think the biggest one is really just that there is a fear of the unknown. Humans are creatures of habit. We don't like changes to our, our routines. And that change can be especially intimidating if it is something that you haven't really experimented with before. Um, and I think there's a fear on a few different fronts. I think there's a reluctance to kind of get involved sometimes with board members. Uh, you know, board members are often fiscally responsible for a nonprofit success. So if you ask a board member to invest in a new technology, they want to be sure that that technology is going to work out because they don't want to risk messing up what's already working. I think there's also a little bit of trepidation for nonprofits, especially small ones that work on thin margins. If you don't have a ton of finances or resources to spend trying something new, it can be really intimidating to try out a new piece of technology that you're not sure is going to work for you. But technology is our friend, right, Abby? <laughs> yes, it absolutely is. <laughs> When it comes to technology, what are the new trends that are happening in fundraising? On episode 31, we talked to Needy Doshi from Payby, and we were talking about digital fundraising and what's new on the horizon for fundraisers. You've got lots of ideas for nonprofits on how they can improve their fundraising. What has been, in your opinion, the single biggest development that you've seen in the past few years? I would say adding on the virtual component to events. You know, people just getting more comfortable with joining online. And now charities can add that to their event, right? Earlier, all the pledging was, you know, just, uh, I guess, limited to people who are in the room who couldn't make it that night and are raising their paddles. And now there is just no reason why somebody couldn't be sitting at home and outbidding them. And if not anything, just driving up the bids. Like we've seen some amazing events where somebody in the room is raiding their paddle and then they got outbid by somebody who was sitting in a remote part of the country. And then the whole bidding war happened and the virtual donor took away the prize. <laughs> both donors joining as if the event was designed for them. I think that is another crucial piece, right? Technology being able to support a donor in their setup, in their environment, and making sure that they have a good experience as well. Fundraising is one thing, but if you don't know how to thank your donors and work with your donor prospects and your donor lists... You've got a long road ahead of you. On episode 36, we talked to Daryl Moser from Donor Perfect about the benefits of donor research and the tips and tricks that he offered our listeners to help them with their donor research a little bit more. What are some things that I should be looking for that I might not be aware of? Well, Joe, that's the part that I get excited about. And the reason that I started life as a computer programmer was because we can end up creating new technology every day that improves some aspect of a person's life um, in, in business. 
And so some of the cool things that have come out over the years, we talked a little bit about check scan. Of course, you know, email is a technology that you can use, um, but even different communication techniques such as texting for events as a text to give methodology. But then we get into some really cutting edge things that we started using where the old handwritten notes that you sent to donors, we now have a, a video platform that right on the donor screen, you push a button. And as an executive director, I can begin recording a video that says, Joe, thank you so much for your gift. It's meant so much to our program. And I send that off to you and it goes via email. If the handwritten note was a personal touch, the video just takes that to the nth degree because you're able to communicate with expression and, and all of these other things that just take it a notch up. Building a donor database is one thing, but what about the info on the people you already have? On episode nine, we talked to Jill McCarville and Mitchell Bruce from iWave about donor management, and they offered us some ideas on how to get more info on the people already in our database. For those folks I've talked to in the past that are a non-for-profit and have a, a donor database where they capture names and addresses, and they usually tell me, we haven't screened our database in the past. And if we have hundreds of constituents or thousands, doing a, something like a well screening would be a great way to identify who are those hidden gems in your database. And I see that all the time where someone might be making them a $500 gift, and they're quite happy about that $500 gift. But when conducting a well screening on their database, and they're able to find out that that person was just as capable of making a $25,000 gift, that can be a game changer. You are listening to a special edition of Impactability, the Nonprofit Leaders Podcast, episode number 50. We're looking at some of the highlights from past episodes. Right now, we'll take a short pause. When we come back, we're going to continue with more highlights, including discussions about communication, some other topics that we've talked about, your hiring problems that you're having at your nonprofit, and of course, the biggest topic of them all, all about boards. So stay close by. You're listening to Impactability, the Nonprofit Leaders Podcast. I'm Joe Turner. We'll be right back. A good, strong board can be the lifeblood of a nonprofit. A passionate and motivated board member can make all the difference to your organization. If your board has a clear vision, shared values, and a sound strategy, your nonprofit can soar. But first, you need to find good board members, align their skills with your goals, train them in the many facets of being a good board member, and keep them motivated. At Sukup Strategic Solutions, our team evaluates the effectiveness and efficiency of your organization's systems in place. We define processes to ensure your organization functions at its best so you can grow your programs and reach more people. We specialize in board recruitment, development, and performance, along with helping you set up or revise policies, establish and kickstart your committees, and lots more. We have facilitated in hundreds of board meetings and retreats and can develop a plan for your board to make it the best it can be. To find out more, visit SukupStrategicSolutions.com and schedule a free consultation. That's S-O-U-K-U-P StrategicSolutions.com. Maximize your nonprofit's impact with Sukup Strategic Solutions. Welcome back to Impactability, the Nonprofit Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Turner. It is episode number 50. We're very excited about reaching this landmark. And to celebrate, we're looking at some of the past episodes, some highlights from past episodes. And we're up to the discussion about communications right now. And one of the things we all concern ourselves with is publicity. How do we get people to recognize us? How do we get people to pay attention to us, especially the media? How do we get them to pay attention? On episode 20, we talked to Kimberly Lohman Clapp about publicity, and she gave us some great ideas on how to get a little publicity. Give us your top five or so tips for getting free publicity. Number one, find your characters. You know, people your organization has helped who are willing to talk about the impact. Number two, I'd say pay attention to the news cycle. Hit when the topic is hot. If you can, connect your story to that big story. And don't wait to invite the media after something has happened. Invite them in when it's going to happen. Number three, I'd say don't be afraid to collaborate with other organizations to launch a big campaign. They may have resources you don't. They may get more of the spotlight. They may get more of the money. But if you get some you've still accomplished your mission. Number four, be super responsive to the media. Give them your cell phone number, answer texts right away. Reporters are on such tight deadlines. If they cannot reach you in the moment, they will probably move on to the next story. 
And I guess my fifth tip would be, again, if you can't get traditional media like radio, newspaper, TV, or even untraditional, the podcasters, the bloggers, always know you can be your own production house through your social media platform. Getting publicity is one thing, but your story is everything. Back on episode 29, we talked to Pan Ingara about the power of the story. If we're trying to write our story, what are some of the questions we need to be asking ourselves? So, Joe, as an organization with a mission, there are three most important questions to ask. Number one, who am I telling the story to? Is it someone who has never heard about my nonprofit? Is it a group of parents whose kids belong to the school I'm doing work for? Are they leaders of corporations looking to give back to the community? So these are specific questions that ask about who am I telling the story to? Secondly, why should the story matter to this audience? Does the mission align with their values and aspirations? Does the mission directly affect any aspect of their lives or the lives of the people that they care about? And the third is, what do I want them to do after they hear my story? Do I want them to donate to the cause? Am I seeking volunteers for my fundraising event? Will this potentially send us maybe good candidates for our board of directors? See, Joe, we get better results from our communication efforts if we have specific goals and objectives behind our storytelling. We are celebrating episode number 50 on impactability, and we're looking back at some of our first episodes and some of the topics we've discussed, and we have had a wide variety of topics. One of our most popular episodes goes back to episode 23, when we're talking about protecting trademarks and intellectual property, some things that you just don't think about, including your very own domain name. There are some unscrupulous characters out there that might be benefiting on your domain. And our guest, Jeannie Seawald, helped us sort things out a little bit and offered some advice. We were talking before we started the show today about a specific incident that you're seeing happen with domain names. It's something that I had, I'd never heard of before, and to me, it's shameful. But I want everyone to know about this because this is huge. Sure. So let's start with just the concept that domain names are assets. And in general, the first person to register a domain name owns the domain name. So things like nonprofit.com, realestate.com, very generic words, first person that registers owns them. The exception to that is if it's a trademark that's owned by someone else, you can't take someone else's trademark and use it in a domain name in a way that could affect their business. So with that in mind, recently I had a situation that came up with a client where I was contacted by a private investigator who had done some work for this client and found that there were some bad actors who had taken the nonprofit's name and set up a domain name using it. And they were raising funds on this website using the domain. So this was a private foundation. So let's just call it the Seawald Foundation. Because they were private, they never were public facing. So they didn't have a website. They didn't solicit funds, but someone had realized that they didn't have a website. So they took their name, the seawaldfoundation.org, registered that domain name and started raising funds under their name. And so it came to light that someone had taken three different foundation names and had the same website set up under each of those domain names with the same board of directors, which actually were photos of realtors pulled off of websites had nothing to do with them. So there are some, you know, bad actors doing things like that out there and people need to really be careful. So to me, the moral of this story is no matter what you're doing with your nonprofit, you should register your domain name as a defensive measure to keep other people from being able to use it in a bad way. So I've suggested to this client that they register their name, .org, .com, .net, .us, you know, some of the broader ones as defensive measures. But once this happens to someone, the only thing they can really do other than contacting the police, the FBI, others, and try to instigate some kind of a criminal prosecution from a standpoint of what I can do to help them is there is a process to try to make someone give you a domain name that has your trademark in it, but it's an expensive process. And so the foundations, 
who did nothing wrong are having to spend a lot of money to try to correct this. One of the topics of discussion on impactability that was very popular was collaboration. We talked to Jason Roa of Avow Hospice about collaboration and his advice to those who might be thinking about matching up with another nonprofit in your area that has the like mission but might be on different sides of town. What advice can you offer the other nonprofits that are listening to our program today about exploring collaboration in their own mission? You know, I would certainly encourage them to reach out and it doesn't matter what type of not-for-profit it is. Generally, you're going to know all of your peers, at least in a, in a certain geography, if not even on a national level. And again, there's probably a lot of these informal collaborations that are already happening where people pick up the phone and just have a question about something, or they might have seen a press release from a a like kind organization about a program or service, and they think, wow, I could probably do that at my program, and they reach out about those things. And so I think to a certain extent, a lot of this uh, informal collaboration is already happening, and probably the advice would be Try and take the next step and figure out if there is a way where you could formalize it, whether it's with an an agreement between two organizations or even if they're thinking on a larger scale like we did, which is uh, forming an organization to help with that collaboration, uh, whether it's negotiations with suppliers, vendors, partners, or even if it's organizations who, again, have contracts with the government, contracts with insurance companies, or other types of contracts where coming together and and negotiating on a larger scale would be beneficial. And so the advice would be reach out to those that do very similar work and see if there is a way that this could work in your specific mission-centered work, whatever you're doing and whatever type of clients that you're serving. Every business has to be concerned with risk mitigation. What are the risks that you take each and every day when you open your doors? Could be employees, could be volunteers. You need to pay close attention each and every day. We talked to Tony Olivo about risk mitigation, and he gave us some great advice about risk mitigation at your nonprofit. How often does someone flash a fake badge to get through? Well, unfortunately, it happens more than you can imagine, um, or they just have one dangling around their neck, which brings in, brings up another good point. A lot of our nonprofits or a lot of ones that we've dealt with have a uh, system where they have a badge that actually people wear while they're in the hallways. And that's another thing. Like, what if somebody's walking down the hallway without one? Or what if it's an employee that you know, you've seen him around before, but he doesn't have a badge on anymore? Well, what happens is if that person was terminated last week and it, a blast didn't go out to the entire organization and this guy's in the building or this lady's in the building and they don't have a badge on, you know, we, we don't challenge people. We don't like to say, Hey, Joe, where's your badge? Did you lose it? Um, you know, that's uncomfortable. But if Joe's supposed to wear his badge, if that's part of the policy and he doesn't have one on, could he be a threat? Potentially it could be a former employee that was let go and now, is looking to do something in there that he shouldn't be doing. And I think that's a big concern. I mean, we think about that, you know, people ask me what keeps me up at night. The friendly person that creates hostile environments, that's what keeps me up at night. The person that used to work there or used to go to school there or used to, you know, drop off deliveries there or something of that nature. So I think that bad situation that you just brought up is very real. One of the hottest topics of discussion lately in the nonprofit sector has been the job market, both for employers and employees. Back on episode 22, we spoke with Mike English and was helping us on the resume, both what we should put on the resume and what we should be looking for on a good resume. My biggest drawback in my job seeking years was always the resume. Now, your job is hiring people. What are you looking for on a resume? What stands out? What am I not putting on my resume that I'm not getting hired? Well, one thing that stands out now for sure is somebody with a longer tenure at different organizations. So it seems like, you know, this is not a recent trend, but it seems like the duration of stays at different jobs is so short that when you see somebody that's been at a company or an organization for more than really more than two years, it kind of stands out now. So that's helpful. If you have that on your resume, that's great. But then I also, I like to see civic engagement, um, volunteer leadership positions. So if you're involved with politics locally, put that. If you're involved with the PTA, your kid's school, put that on the resume. 
it's really just from my perspective, great to see people that are civically engaged because what it means is that, you know, they're kind of go-getters, but also they probably have a lot of good contacts. And then finally, I think it's just important to customize your resume and cover letter to the job you're applying for. That seems obvious, but most people don't do that. So when it's clear that somebody has created a resume really specifically for that job for which they're applying, that really stands out as very helpful and actually really shine through. And then the cover letter, I just, I think I would say only about 50% of cover letters I see are really customized for the job the person's applying for. So if it's a job you want, take the time to craft your resume and job description to match what they're looking for. While finding the right people for the job is one thing, having a diverse, inclusive workplace is also vitally important today. On Episode 7, we talked to Riley Reynolds about the workplace and how creating a diverse, inclusive environment can make all the difference in the world. What are some of the things that nonprofits can do to like build a more inclusive organization? So I would say, don't be afraid to have those hard conversations. You know, nine times out of 10, a situation can be improved just by talking it out. Uh, I'd also say, you know, make sure that the population that you serve has role models that they can relate to within your organization. And lastly, track your data. You'd definitely be surprised as to what it'll show you. But let's be clear, don't do it for the sake of it. Do it for the reason behind it, correct? Absolutely, Joe. Don't just jump into DEI because funders are asking you about it. Do it because it's our civil duty as humans to strive for equality for everyone, no matter their race, gender, sexual orientation, or other demographics. One of the most popular topics, probably the most popular topic on our program thus far, has been about boards and executive directors. Now, when it comes to building a strong board, what is the difference between a sitting board member and a serving board member? We asked Jamie Ross to weigh in on the difference between the two. What is the difference between sitting on a board and serving on a board? Because we hear both so many times. Right, right. That, that's very true. And that is something that has to do with an effective board, right? So you don't want people who are just sitting on the board, um, which means that they come to board meetings, but that's about it. They're not really serving the organization. So you might actually have board members who want to serve the board, but you know they've never been asked. So they just come and they sit on the board. So this also gets back to if you recruited them for good reason, you probably had an idea that they were going to be of service. So make sure that you are asking them to be of service. Are you involving them on a committee and allowing them to move the mission of the organization forward in contrast to just sitting on the board, just showing up at meetings? So it really is a two-way street. But if you find that, you know what, I'm really trying to engage this board member, but they're really just not interested. They're really just interested in sitting on the board. That's where it really helps you to have a set of bylaws that speaks to the term of board members and how you can move on and get additional board members. So I recommend that you do have term limits. Also in that episode, number five, Building a Strong Board, we talked a lot about the relationship between boards and executive directors. I highly recommend you go back and check out that episode. So when it comes to executive directors, we all want to be the best executive director we can be. And Peggy Monson weighed in on the succession plan. So what if you've been an executive director for quite some time and maybe it's time to think about moving on or maybe you're retiring? How do you come up with a successful succession plan? How does the executive director establish a good succession plan? That's a good question. And I think sometimes that this is a conversation that doesn't happen. I could give you ideas about why that is, but it doesn't happen a lot. And I think it's extremely important. And this is where the executive director works with the board. Um, The board has that primary responsibility. Okay. So If there is not a succession plan stated somewhere in your organizational documents, that conversation needs to be had. Sometimes I say to myself, okay, what happens if, you know, my my executive director doesn't show up tomorrow or can't show up? Or what is that worst case scenario? And hopefully it will never happen, but the board should have a plan for an emergency situation. And also a plan for plan vacancy. So you probably have communicated with your board in some way, 
your plan? Are you going to be there five years, 10 years? Is there a contract? Is it, is it just, you know, an understanding? But what is the plan for when you vacate your, the, the organization? So plan for emergencies and have a plan vacancy and just make sure there's a recruiting plan. And this gets back to the person inside the organization that wants to be considered. There should be in that plan a consideration for internal candidates. And if there's not, there should be. So um, we look internally as well as externally for candidates. On episode 24, we talked to an executive director who put 30 years in the same chair, the life and times of an executive director. We were talking to Susan McManus about the top things that she wishes as she looked back on her career that she did differently. As you look back on your career as an executive director, what are the top three things that you would have done differently? I would have taken more of my vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I There was always something that got in the way. And I uh, always felt like I needed to be there when I probably didn't. They probably would have been fine without me. I would have spent a lot more time with the people we were serving. Um, and I would have written a lot more personal thank you notes, I think. To me... I I never feel like I can do enough of it. The personal note that if you stop each week to look at the gifts of time, the gifts of money, the staff, dedication, commitment, I still, you know, wish every week I'd written more of them each week. They're so important. And a big salute to all of the executive directors in our audience as well as every single person who works in the nonprofit sector day in and day out. The selfless work you do is making a difference in the communities you serve. That's what this program is all about. It's been my pleasure to host it up till now. We look forward to the next 50 episodes. And of course, you are a very important part of this program. As always, your feedback is very important to us. Make sure you're following us on Facebook and Instagram. Also, you're downloading our podcasts and please, 